It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. I think I found something. Pretty good, yeah. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Oh, stop it. And a go. Scar Britain for antiques. Ooh, I think it's brilliant. The aim? To make the biggest <laughs> profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. You're some man. There'll be worthy winners and valiant losers. <laughs> oh. Will it be the high road to glory? Yeah, baby. Or the slow oh. road to disaster? Oh, oh. This <laughs> is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> yeah. The perfect day for another antiques adventure. Navigating the sun-kissed B-roads of Britain are experts Izzy Balmer and Charlie Ross. Oh, oh my God! Oh, my God. I'm I can't see. Where are we? <laughs> Izzy, are you there? <laughs> I'm here, Charlie. Ah, <laughs> uh, always looking on the brighter side of life, eh, Roscoe? Have you modelled your hair this morning on anything specific? Why? What are you saying? Who was in Breakfast at Tiffany's? Audrey, Audrey Hepburn. Hepburn. You look just like Audrey Hepburn. Do I? You do. Why, thank you, Charlie. That's in the fact, nicest I, thing I thought I was said. in the car with Audrey Hepburn. In fact, Charlie, your hair's getting a bit long on the sides. Are you growing it? Well, it only grows at the sides. <laughs> He's styling it into a top knot. <laughs> a top knot? It's nice to be do you think I could do it? I, I haven't got enough for a top knot. No, it'll be a no. stick on top knot. No, my about... hairstyle is modelled on a boiled egg. <laughs> <laughs> Gleaming, like Charlie said, <laughs> is this pristine 1968 Triumph 2000 to help us sashay through the Wiltshire countryside. Do you work in Wiltshire, don't I you? I do work in Wiltshire. Oh, local knowledge. This is your big chance, isn't it? This is where your expertise will shine forth like a beacon and leave old Roscoe in the gutter. Feeling rather pressured now, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with a bit of healthy competition. In spite of some great finds, Izzy's been somewhat unlucky at auction. That said, she's grown her £200 starting sum by £45 to P. Charlie's porker has certainly grown in stature. No, he hasn't put on weight, but he does have close to £328 to play with on this leg. I'm a bit nervous about today. I am not as confident as I was. Oh! There's a chink in my armour. Oh! <laughs> You'd like to see a chink in my armour, don't you? I'd like to see a bloody great big large hole in your armour. <laughs> Call that fighting talk. Look out, Charlie. This road trip set off from the Cotswolds and wended through South Wales. The route sent them along the south coast before a final auction battle in... Battle! <laughs> the road's getting narrower and narrower. Is he? Yes, Charlie. Where are you taking me? To the next shop. I'm not sure you are, is he? I thought I'd leave you in the woods because you're being annoying. <laughs> Carry on without you. Ah. The fourth leg of this jostle will end at auction in Sidmouth, but we start in the stunning city of Salisbury. <laughs> at the aptly named Salisbury Antique Centre. Well, if that isn't straight to the door, what is? Door-to-door -door service. Door-to-door -door service. Come on! Ladies first. <gasps> the cheek. This. Oh, it's gorgeous. Charlie, this is your area. This is your arena. I'm going to spend all my money. Furniture. I shall see you later. <laughs> Bye. Good dinner, sir. Old, brown, shiny. This place is right up Charlie's street. This is the most incredible emporium. Every single corner is covered with gorgeous Georgian furniture. All my things. The trouble is, I don't think there's anything in my budget. Oh, do come on. There must be something, Charlie. Try smaller. Bound to be cheaper. How about that? Nice tea caddy. It's got its bowl as well. A mixing bowl. What wood is that? Oh, Charlie, I don't know. I'm terrible with wood. No, you wouldn't be expected to know. A stripy it's a one. Wood. It's it a is. zebra wood. No, it's... Giraffe wood? Tiger wood? Different animal, a bird. It's a bird. Partridge wood. Really? Yeah. I was kind of on the right yep. line. Yeah, you, you were. You weren't far away. Tiger, partridge, 
No difference at all, really. Oh, well. You can't afford it. No. I can. £250. It is a stretch for Izzy's limited funds. What's more within range? I do love a chair. I love how honest these are. But Charlie has managed to get ahead of me by taking risks. So I feel like it's time for me to do the same and take a risk. But wouldn't it be brilliant if they did really well? Because Charlie loves his chairs. Oh, I just don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have a thing. I'll see if I spot anything else. I'll have a thing. You do that. Charlie's gone a bit quiet. What's he up to? No good, I suspect. Aha. There's a little room here. Staff only. Could be the loo. I hope he's got permission. <laughs> we might be able to find something in my budget. Good Lord. I don't even know what that is. It's rather ingenious. It's very cheap. It's certainly old. It's certainly 19th century. I need to find out what it is. While you get to the bottom of that, Izzy's tracked down a dealer. What's she found? Chris, I spotted quite a few bits in this cabinet. However, none of them have a price, uh -huh. which I'm hoping means they can be really, really cheap. They can be very good price. Excellent. Yes. This is music to my ears, Chris. <laughs> well, if we start with this one... Yes. I just thought this was beautifully modelled with the cherub and the lion. I mean, I'm presuming it's probably from something. You are right. It, it's almost certainly the lid from some kind of pot. It's definitely a Grand Tour Italian bronze. Oh, yes. In the 18th and 19th century, the Grand Tour was a travel experience, studying the art and antiquities of continental Europe. Well-heeled travellers brought back souvenirs, like this little bronze, missing its bottom. Is so very pretty and decorative, isn't it? Yeah. And, and you know, period. And period, absolutely. So we'll talk money later. Right. So I want to show you all my goodies first. <laughs> okay. And this little dish with yes. the coin in the silver center. dish with a Marie Theresa in, which is dated 1780. Because it's not hallmarked the dish, is it? No, so... no, it's not. The white metal dish is inset with an Austrian coin bearing the correct monarch's head for the Holy Roman Empress Maria Theresa from what price I need for that, there's going to be a profit in it. OK. I hope. So if I was to get these two, are we at 60 or are we less? We could be a little less. We could, could we? We could. What could we be? We could be 50. Sort of 30 and 20. 30 and 20, that's, that's how I see them. Thank you so much, that's wonderfully fair. I'm going to put these back. I'm yeah. definitely going to take them, so I'll shake on it right now. Two lots in the old bag, but Izzy will browse on. Charlie's still off limits in the back room, and hot on his heels is dealer Kate. Yes, I saw the sign that said uh, <laughs> staff only. <laughs> well, you're most welcome. <laughs> and I Have thought a good this is this is <laughs> well, it's great. I've had a good look in here. I mean, the things outside are fantastic, but sadly my budget doesn't allow. But I have spotted a couple of things up here, which I'm quite amused by. Oh, yes. A chestnut rooster. Well, is it? I How think it interesting, because it looks like a chestnut rooster, but I've never seen a chestnut rooster with a whirly gig oh, on top. You don't want them to burn at the bottom, so no. you have to keep moving them around. Chestnuts would go in there. And yes, there's some little holes. That... What a great Maybe thing. Maybe some old chestnuts still. Do you like chestnuts? I do. So do I. I love a chestnut. And some other unusual items of kitchenalia have also caught Charlie's eye. Now, what is that? I think it's probably for weighing eggs. Get away. I don't believe that. Well, well you, you have to have eggs. even weights, don't you, for eggs and flour and butter? You do. Just like in my traditional Victoria sponge recipe. It's very good, but not on that gadget. Oh, hang on. It's got a maker's name on it. Do you know who it's made by? No, I don't. Eggwear. <laughs> well, I'm wrong, aren't I? <laughs> Arthur Eggwear. Well, that gives it You're away, very clever. Baby, isn't it? <laughs> I hadn't spotted that. Both the uh, chestnut roaster and the eggwear are unpriced, and Charlie spied another curiosity. You've got one other item which is alongside it. Yeah. Which is a guillotine, and I think I know what this is because I think I've bought one before. And I think that is for chopping your baguette. It is. It's it? a big baguette cutter. A baguette cutter. It's French. Mm, definitely. No French. doubt. Yes. 
But what <laughs> could Kate do on the price? If I said, could I have a price for all three, would there be a sort of never-to-be-forgotten price, which I've got in the back of my head? 150 Oh, blimey. Um... I was hoping to buy them all for 100 quid. Oh. I, I don't think I'm going to make a fortune on them. I, I think yeah. they'll make... I don't know what they'll make. I don't know whether the egg maker... Have, no, have them for 100 and then you'll know if you see any in the future. Put it there. Let's call it £20 for the baguette chopper, 30 for the chestnut roaster and 50 for the egg wire. Mr Ross is off the mark. Ha, 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 ha. I'm going to have a baguette for lunch. You do that. Chop it into bits. Upstairs, meanwhile, Izzy's having a second look at those chairs. Chris, I do like a good chair, and I'm presuming they're made out of oak. Uh, no, no. I think they're beech. Almost. Uh, let me put my glasses on so I can see what I'm Charlie's looking at. Charlie's trying to teach me about woods, and as you can see, he's got a long way to go. <laughs> yep, they're beech. Probably early 19th century. The pair of nursing chairs are priced at 50. But could Chris do a bit better? I'd do them for 40. That would be my best. I'm going to take a risk. I've been playing it safe and Charlie has not only snuck ahead, he has properly leaped over me into the lead and I don't really want him to stay there. No, we've got to try and get one over on I certainly do, yes. so I'm going to take a chance on these. Yes, please, well, thank I you very much. I hope you do much. well on them. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. what a great start to this trip, eh? Both experts have already found three lots to take to auction. Bravo! <laughs> And with that, Charlie's taking a break from shopping just a few miles west in wonderful Wilton. Famous people have been born there. <laughs> He's come to learn the intriguing story woven into the history of this town. One of industrial espionage and religious persecution. A little known tale that'll pull the rug from under his feet. And who better to tell it than carpet maker Rob Lode? Hello, Rob. Hiya, Charlie. Pleased to meet you. Welcome to Wilton. Thank you. My first ever visit to Wilton. Lovely. Follow me. You've not lived. For over 300 years, Wilton has been the centre of British carpet weaving and the factories here have created luxury floorings for the great and good for generations. But the origins of modern carpet making lie far away from Wiltshire. Oh, yes. So, Rob, we're talking about carpets here. Where did it start? Well, it started a long, long time ago in the Far East, Persia, Asia was the first carpet as we would know it. And over time, through the trade routes, the manufacture or the sale of carpets eventually ended up in France. In France. It came over from France to the UK and ended up here in Wilton. Right. Around about 1700. The processes developed at that time gave birth to the Wilton carpet we know today. This is where the factory began, yeah. um, all those hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And the French were brought over uh, in 1741. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, smuggled in into wine barrels. Well, that's a wonderful way to avoid the customs, isn't it? And who was it that instigated this move? The Earl of Pembroke at the time yeah. um, wanted to improve the weaving in Wilton, and he had this idea to bring these weavers across yes. from France. In early 18th century France, skilled Huguenot weavers created quality carpets, but they faced persecution for their Protestant religious beliefs. And large numbers left France following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. But once in Britain, these weavers brought new skills and artistry into the British industry. Look at that. They invented, really, the modern system of Wilton weaving yeah. that we can see still at Wilton today. The continental craftsmen brought their technique of using a single strand of yarn rather than fixing tufts of yarn in place. With local coarser wool, it made for a thicker, sturdier carpet. Rob's taking Charlie to the factory's <laughs> oldest working looms to see this process in action. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. I know it's a loom, but what year is it? This one is a 1937 vintage, but it still does what it needs to do, Quite. which is weave top-quality 
cut part. How does it work? Would you like to just show that, Mike? Wire's been pulled out. Yeah. And the little blade's cutting the loops, which is actually making the file. Is it possible for me to have a go, Mike? Of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Come on, if you could stand on this board. Yep. And it's a matter of pushing the handle. Yep. So just push it out. I've got this one, sorry. Piece of cake. <laughs> Well done. You can have a job. You can. <laughs> You're a bit younger than Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> That's amazing. Could be the start of a whole new career, Charlie. Oh, oh do behave. <laughs> With the open road ahead and the trusted Triumph on the move, how's Izzy getting on? I feel proper excited that I've bought three items and I really like each of my items, but I'm still nervous because Charlie is so much further ahead than me and I just don't know that I've done quite enough to catch him up. Don't get in a dizzy, Miss Izzy. <laughs> There's plenty of time left yet. She's powering on to the town of Shaftesbury. Here we are at King's Settle Antiques. Oh, don't slam it. It's nearly antique. There are collectibles to your left? No, to the right. <laughs> no, left again. Oh, she's a minx. <laughs> there are antiques everywhere. And with just over £155 left to spend, what to buy? This is a Victorian boot scraper. It's cast iron, which you can tell straight away from the weight of it. It's really heavy. It's also a giveaway that it's not a reproduction. You get so many repro boot scrapers, but invariably they're much lighter, they're much more cheaply made. Apart from the age, what I particularly like about it is I love the design. So you've got these scrolls here, typically Victorian. The Victorians loved using their scroll work. But the bit that appeals to me even more are these fabulous animal figural details at the top here. I mean, I'm not entirely sure what they are. They could be an elephant, they could be a wolf, or they, you know, they could be something mythical. But I really, really like them. The other thing about a boot scraper is it still usable? I mean, how many times have you been for a muddy walk with your welly boots on and you need to scrape the mud off your boots before you walk into the house? And they do sell well at auction when they're the genuine artefact. Now, this one is priced at £49. I would quite like to get it for about 30 So I'm thinking if I make a cheeky offer of 20 maybe I'll get it for 30 It's worth a shot. Worth a scrape? Why are we whispering? Dealer Bob, here's Izzy. I'm hoping I can make you a bit of a cheeky offer and you're not going to be offended by I'm it. I'm sure it's going to be cheeky. What, <laughs> it's what, definitely what going to be What are we going to see? <laughs> OK, so where are you coming at? Well, I was wondering if £20 would be acceptable. <laughs> uh, afraid not. What were you thinking? OK, it's £28. Do you know what? I will shake on that. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Another buy in the old bag. But will this boot scraper do more than wipe its face at auction? Who writes this? <laughs> With £127 left to spend tomorrow, that's Izzy shopping done for today. Should we go and get some dinner? What would you like? Pie, chips and gravy. Why aren't you 400 stone? Well, I am sometimes. <laughs> I feel it. I think I'll have a salad. <laughs> that's why I am 400 stone. Too many salads in my life. Is that what you call them? Nighty night. It's a crisp autumnal morning in Hampshire for Charlie and Izzy. Oh, look at the conkers here. Wow, oh, I love conkers. And there are loads stop, of stop, conkers stop, on stop, that trip. What is she up to? Go and get some conkers. God, look at all those conkers. Look at all these conkers. Here's a conker. Have you ever played conkers? Oh, shall we have a game? Oh, here's another conker. Right, I think we've got enough. One no, more. No, no, no. I want to find some more. Come on. <laughs> There's a car behind. OK, I'm coming. Izzy, I'm get coming. the car. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. I've got lots of prickly conkers. <laughs> I'll give you pretty conkers. <laughs> Quickly. 
Fucking <laughs> sorry, sir. Charlie, look at all these conkers. Why are you so passionate about conkers? I don't know, like, through the centuries, everyone's played conkers. Yeah. It's something all kids do, and um, you get some really pretty ones. I'll have a game of conkers later. I soak mine in vinegar overnight and then bake it in the arga. Ah. <sighs> Yesterday, you'd think Charlie was going on a picnic. He bought a chestnut roaster. Rather ingenious. An egg wear and a baguette guillotine. <laughs> I was going to have a baguette for lunch. Oh, for one hundred pounds. Izzy, meanwhile, picked up four items, <laughs> including that Italian bronze figure, a pair of nursing chairs. Well, I'm going to take a chance on these. The silver trinket dish and a cast iron boot scraper. Love the design. Spending one hundred and eighteen pounds on a very interesting group. <laughs> what have you bought? I bought three pieces of rusty old nineteenth-century metal. Oh, that's some, a way I might describe you. <laughs> Did you buy any furniture? Yes. Charlie, exactly. I had a bit of a ridiculous moment and bought two chairs. Well done. That's just the sort of thing I do. I, well, I know. I think you're rubbing off onto me. <laughs> dear, oh, dear. After dropping off Izzy, Charlie's going to the village of Odium in Hampshire. Handy parking. Look at that. Right outside all sorts. Ah, and a welcoming party too. Macaroons, my fave. Superbe! Merci. Pour moi? Oui. Bon appétit. Très bien. Save one for me. Excellent! <laughs> Magnifique! Uh, well, that's the best greeting I've ever had in a shop. A French lady with macarons. It's like being in France. <laughs> yes. The old ton cordial is alive and well. Best get on with finding some sweet little antiques, eh? <laughs> Anything appeal on this table of silver goodies? Aha! That takes my eye immediately. The helmet-shaped cream jug, which I'm hoping will be Georgian. <sighs> Just my luck it isn't. But it is a Chester hallmark, and it's Edwardian, 19... Somewhere between 1910 and 1920. Sauce boat. And that is Sheffield. Similar sort of age. I wonder if all these came from the same place. Jerry, do come in. Charlie. They're all unpriced, which well, is the are. way I really like yeah, it, they're, Jerry. Well, to me, they're priceless. <laughs> yeah, oh, but... no. <laughs> yeah. Have you got any scales? It's not really fair to mm. sell things by weight, but mm. it is mm. relevant to a certain extent. Oh, yes, yes. You know, something like yeah. a cream jug is worth much mm. more than its yeah. um, silver weight. Teapots, sadly, as you know. When did you last have a cup of tea out of a silver teapot? Um, not recently, I'll be no. honest with you. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Will you speak for yourself? We've got some post office scales here, lovely you old have. things. Oh, splendid. Should do the trick. As a precious metal, silver has an intrinsic value. It's always worth something at auction, at the very least, according to its weight. It's a bit like weighing cakes, isn't it? It is, really? it is, yes. Five hundred six, seven hundred grams, three seven. Sorry. I think I'd like to offer hundred and seventy pounds. Call it 180. Yeah. We, we, we would be fine with that. Let's give it a. Okay, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you Pleasure. very much Pleasure. indeed. Thank you. Well done. Not quite running off with the family silver, and with just short of 48 pounds left in his wallet, Charlie will motor on to the last shop. Izzy's taking a short rest from shopping and has headed 13 miles south to the village of Selborne. It's here, in this beautiful place, that a humble 18th century parson called Gilbert White had a huge impact on science. With his pioneering work recording the local flora and fauna. It is come to where it all began at White's home now a museum, to visit with collections manager Kimberly James. What was Gilbert White's legacy? Gilbert White's legacy really was to inspire generations of other naturalists, in particular Charles Darwin, who 
thought that he stood on the shoulders of Gilbert White and came here to Selborne to see White Selborne. But he also inspired naturalists all the way through to today, where modern naturalists quite often quote that they were inspired by Gilbert White. And he was basically like the David Attenborough of the 18th century. Gilbert White found pleasure in the natural world and was a country cleric who saw the study of the natural sciences as a celebration of God's work. At his Hampshire home, White created places of study in perfect isolation. Hello, what is this? This would have been where Gilbert White would have um, observed nature. This is his wine pipe seat, which is a wine barrel with a thatched roof that he would have used as a bird hide. He built this, and this would have been somewhere that he could sit and observe nature, be protected from the weather, and be hidden from the birds so they wouldn't be scared to approach. It's really small, isn't it? And unusual. It is. Looking. Well, Gilbert was only five foot three, so he would okay. have been in here quite nicely. Well, mighty oaks from little acorns grow. A young White spent a significant amount of time in his garden. It was his inquiring interest that motivated him to record what he sowed and grew. He was a keen gardener almost before he was a naturalist and would spend hours in the garden harvesting really unusual things for the 18th century, like melons and cucumbers. I mean, it's quite impressive he was growing a melon in this sort of climate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he had, would have had a, a special setup um, where he would have used uh, manure with um, a glass top, which would have created the heat that he needed to um, grow melons, um, and then would harvest them and have a melon party. <laughs> a melon party? Yeah. I like the sound of that. Gilbert White continued to observe the countryside and became famous for his pioneering methods, what he called observing narrowly. Rather than learn from books or resort to dissecting animals like his contemporaries, he chose to record everything he saw and heard in minute detail. But Gilbert made quite a few discoveries. He was the first to identify the harvest mouse as being a separate species, the first to describe um, the nocturnal bat. He also realised that the chiffchaff, the wood warbler and the willow warbler were three distinct species, because even though they look identical, they have three separate birdsong. Did his discoveries change the way in which people looked at the natural world? Absolutely. For example, earthworms. Before Gilbert, people really just thought that they'd been put on the earth to annoy gardeners. Mm. but Gilbert realised that they were really integral to our ecosystem. White described any extinction of the earthworm as a lamentable chasm because it would affect both the animals that relied on them for food and the vegetation for growth. From 1767, Gilbert White began sending correspondence of his discoveries to like-minded naturalists. He later gathered all his writings to form one extraordinary text, this is the manuscript of the Natural History of Selborne, which was the book that Gilbert White published. So this is Gilbert's handwriting. It's really fascinating to look at because he's underlined bits, he's crossed bits mm -hmm. out, there's bits of paper stuck on top. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a real work in progress. It is, it? absolutely. And obviously today, if we are not quite happy with how something is, we can just delete it. But that wasn't the case in the 18th century. But these letters, are what eventually um, became the Natural History of Selborne, which is this book here. This is a first edition. It was published in 1789 and has been in continuous print all that time. It's never been out of print. And it's wow. been through so many editions that it's thought to be the fourth most published book in the English language. Reputedly behind the Bible, the works of Shakespeare and the Pilgrim's Progress. The song of the red star is superior, though somewhat like that of the white throat. Some birds have a few more notes than others. Sitting very placidly on the top of a tall tree in a village, the cock sings from morning to night. It does read like a book, doesn't it? Yeah, like absolutely. A story book. I mean, you can tell how he has really observed these birds. Yeah, 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 yeah. He he's really familiar with yes. them. Yes. And he's trying to get to across to other people that might be interested to look out and have a look themselves to mm. see whether they can see them. Mm. 230 years on, and a mere 300 editions later, <laughs> Gilbert White's published observations are still being enjoyed the world over today. And you can go and visit his house. How lovely. Back on the road, how's Roscoe feeling about his dwindling money pot? It's not often I go into a shop and spend £180, but that's exactly what I've done. 
that. Silver price can go up, silver price can go down. Just hope it doesn't plummet before the auction. Will Charlie's next stop have a silver lining? He's heading to Fleet in Hampshire. And serendipity. Can he strike lucky with only £47.96 to his name? Nod, nod, wink, wink. Anything catching your eye? Ooh, that's a big one. This is a cowbell. I have never, ever seen such a big cowbell. And that's got some age. I would think that's a 19th century cowbell and almost certainly from Switzerland. I absolutely love it. But it's such a size. It must have been a hell of a strong cow. Mm, moving on. Bell of the ball. <laughs> Izzy has crossed the county line and into Surrey to the village of Bramley. The locale of memories antiques. She's got a bit of catching up to do and £127 to spend. Will Izzy play safe or take the risk? Another bell ringer. They're both at it. I have found a bit of silver. It's a silver pedestal dish. This is quite a small one. It would possibly have been used for trinkets, possibly sweetmeats or bonbons. It's hallmarked for London and 1913, so it's just outside of the Edwardian period. We're just into early George V here. For something small, it's got quite a good weight to it. The gauge of the silver is thick. It's not a cheap piece, this. No, a functional piece of silver too, and the price? Well, I think that says 58. I mean, it possibly says 28, but fairly certain it says 58. Best get shop owner Jane over for a closer inspection. I think that says 58 pounds. You're right, it does. Is there any movement on that price? Yeah, but let's settle on 40. That seems very fair, and I think that gives me a fighting chance. So, Good. yes, please, okay, that would be super. He? Thank you very, Thanks. very much. Yeah, your last Thanks. buy for today, girl. Let's see if it pays off at auction. 20 miles or so away in Fleet, what has Roscoe found? Money box, cast iron, or is it brass? incredibly difficult to tell. Citibank is an American bank founded in the early 19th century. I don't think it's a reproduction. I can be caught out by these things. You know, they're so cleverly reproduced and they're pretty simple to make. But it just doesn't have the feel. It's a slightly better casting than a reproduction one. Great thing about this is the more money you put in, the more you can see it as well. Enough to hold what little cash you've got left, old boy. What's the price? And it's £15. Not a lot of money. And, as they say, there's not a lot of downside. Look out, Wendy. Here he comes. I am going to buy it, if I may. Lovely. You may. Thank you Thank very, you very much, much, Charlie. very much indeed. With that the last buy, I have to ask, will it be a banker for auction? I think it will. feeling you're going to be absolutely up with me after this auction. It's going to be neck and neck. Well, that'd be an exciting finish, wouldn't it? I know. A canter to the finish line. Oh, finish gallop, line. gallop. I'll gallop. You can canter. <laughs> yes, I'll stroll. A photo finish. <laughs> Sleep tight. Sound the alarm? It's auction day in the seaside town of Sidmouth. How oh, lovely situated on the Jurassic Coast. Which expert will be sailing to victory today? There's nothing like a stroll in a the stroll? Sun. You're setting a really rather fast pace here. Here it is. After you, madam. Oh, thank you. Such a gent. Anyway, get your skates on, you two. We're at the end of the penultimate leg of this trip. Beginning in Salisbury, our experts have twisted and turned their way to Sidmouth. And today, we're at Potbury's auction rooms. 
Izzy bought five lots, some on the more adventurous side of her expertise, totalling £158. But what will Charlie make of Izzy's chairs? Great to see Izzy buying furniture. Do you think she bought these specially for me? They're ladder back, they're 19th century, the rush seating's in good order. Cost £40 worth, I would say £40. You'll be hoping, Roscoe. Charlie also bought five lots, spending just shy of £300. When I've seen baguette cutters sell before, they don't usually make a huge amount of money. What I do like about it, though, is its age and its history, and it's clearly sliced lots of baguettes in its time, so hopefully it will slice Charlie a nice profit. Today's auctioneer is Philip Hurst. What are his thoughts on our experts' lots? The early 20th century silver pedestal dish, a nice pretty little thing, but nevertheless the estimate will be based on the weight in the region of 30 to 40 pounds, I think. The 19th century egg scale is one of my favourite lots in the auction. Great character to it. I like the balance of the thing. I like the little apple-shaped weight on it. It's got a great deal of character. I'm thinking in terms of 50 to 100 pounds. It's not long now. The auction room is buzzing with bids being taken in the room and online. In you come. Get yourself settled, dears. Ooh, I'll never get out of here. This is wonderful. Good night. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> it's packed. There's a number of people Come to see you. Sleep. I don't think... No dribbling, Charlie. <laughs> First up is Izzy's Italian bronze figure. Well, here it is. Here it is. One commission bid on this starts me at £10. Well, Charlie. Look to the room, look around for any bids. 12, thank you. 14, 16, oh. 18, 20. Here we go, Izzy. 20, no, sir. Commission bidder at 18 pounds. Unlucky. Don't worry, lots more lots to come. Oh, Izzy, it's not fair. You've bought nice well, things. And it's an antique. You're always teasing me about 20th century. I've bought I know, antiques I know, this time. I know, I know, I know. First for Charlie, the group lot of silver. They look very smart, don't they? I love the helmet shaped cream jug. I mean, that could be Georgian. Two commissions for the bids for these, which start me at £170. That's not bad. I look to the room for £180. £170 commission bid. I'm about to sell. What a shame. Looks like it's stuck exactly to its weight price. I was just hoping in the space of a couple of days that the silver price would have doubled. <laughs> Will Izzy's Maria Theresa trinket dish pay off for her? Maria oh, Theresa. Such we say, £15. I paid for 20 at 12 at 10 anyone? Oh, oh, oh come on. 10 on, are we, on, bid. 10 on bid. Thank you. 12 There's a man bidding, don't worry. Bid of 10, I'm come on. for 12. At £10, oh, pounds, I'm about bid. to sell. Fair it's warning. Terrible. Such a shame. But only a small loss. I think he's stolen that, is he? I think so too. Charlie will be hoping his money box is a banker. If that was my money box, I wouldn't have very much in the bottom, but I suspect your money box would be full to the brim of money. Actually, it's not big enough. <laughs> ten pounds, anyone? Ten, ten, thank you. I'm bid ten. Twelve, oh, come fourteen, on. sixteen, eighteen, 18 minutes. twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, thank you. Oh, Six, well done. Twenty-four pounds. First profit of the day goes to Charlie. Not to be sniffed at, Miss Barmer. I am not sniffing at it. Good. <laughs> Next is Izzy's big gamble, the pair of 19th century chairs. Come on, Charlie. 10, thank you, 12. 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. There were a lot of bad as you're getting there. Fair warning, at £30. They were worth taking a risk on, but sadly, not money makers. Why did I ever think buying chairs was a good idea? Why did I listen to not you? I cannot possibly <laughs> imagine. <laughs> Will Charlie's chestnut roaster pop a profit? I don't know if I'd prefer your chestnut roaster to be a chestnut roaster or a coffee roaster, because I like both. I have two commission bids which start me at £18. Oh, no, not I enough. Room for 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. Oh, come back on. with me on commission, £30. 32, yeah. 34, 36, 38, 39, 40, 42. Oh, come 
more blood. For, fair warning at £42. Well done. Nice find. Goodly profit. There's a lady in the back there that's bought a couple of my things. Yes, she hasn't been on any of mine. I know. She's a woman, obviously, of impeccable taste and no shortage of funds. Is she a relation? <laughs> what about Izzy's scraper? <laughs> Concentrate. Here comes your boot scraper. Commission bid starts me at £10. Oh. I look to the room for 12 Room for 12 40 16 18 There's somebody 20, over there with some very muddy boots. 28 with me, 30 with you. Let's have a new bidder. Fair warning at £30. I'm about to sell. <laughs> It wiped its face. Every little helps, and your first profit, girl. What will be, will be. Yeah, can Charlie get a good price for his baguette guillotine? You know when you go to France, don't you just love going to a boulangerie each morning? The smell. The smell. Oh, and asking in French for your bread and your croissants. Oh, 20, anyone? 20, I'm big. 20 pounds. 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. Charlie Ross. They're all about the characters down here. Fair warning at £36. C'est magnifique. It's not another profit, is it? It... Um... <laughs> Can Izzy's final lot, her silver pedestal dish, bring her some cheer? I could see somebody in a shop asking £75 for that. I really could. Two commission bids start me at £28. Well, I that that's good stuff. 30, 32, 34, oh. 36, 38, Is he? 40, 42, two in the room. Well done. We need another one, don't we? At £42, fair warning. Just over the auctioneer's estimate and is a profit before costs. So you're only I'm down not going to let you dampen off. my positivity. Would I? What's next? Positive vibes. We are all egg static for Charlie's final item, the egg scale. You know how you always say that your head's like a boiled egg? Yeah. Well, is that why the egg wear appealed to you? Yeah. Well, the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wait my head. Here they come. Now, look, this is a big risk. I have four commission bids. <gasps> These start me at £140. No! Pounds. <laughs> I look to the room for £150. Any advance? Charlie With me, then, at £150. Weigh my eggs. Commission bid. Fair warning. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Great price for a rare and interesting thing. You come with me and I'll buy you something nice, like an enormous ice cream by the seaside. Come on. Great idea. Fingers and thumbs at the ready. Let's work out the sums. Now, Izzy hoped to add to the £245 in her piggy bat after costs. She's made a loss of just over £50 and now has 193 for the last leg. She'll pull it back. I know she will. Charlie started with over £327. After fees, he's made a profit of £43 and fattens his pig to over £370. He retains the lead, but Izzy could still catch him. Izzy, where are you? Your ice cream's melting. My ice cream's melting. It's about to pour with rain, and you said meet me by the seaside. There's only one thing for it. I'm going to have to have both of them. A moment on the lips, Charlie. A lifetime on the hips. 